Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with you. Um, Roseanne, maybe we can start, since I'm a historian. Uh, I've read how you grew up in Southern California, and the music uh, of that area influenced you, or it was what you were listening to when you were young. Uh, what was some of the music uh, from that period that uh, you remember and that still lives on with you? Um. Well, first, thanks for having me, and it's an honor to talk with you, Julian. I feel a little intimidated by you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in Southern California in the 60s and 70s, well, before that, I was listening to what my parents listened to, my dad, to my dad himself, what he listened to, my mother listened to Ray Charles and Patsy Cline and Marty Robbins, so all of that kind of went in by osmosis, but um, then when I grew up, grew old enough to find things on the radio myself and discovered the Beatles, that was a game changer. And, um, you know, whatever was in Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Joni Mitchell, Elton John, um, all of those bands of the 60s and 70s in Southern California made an enormous imprint on me. But I think also a turning point for me was when I heard Joni Mitchell's Blue, um, it was the first time, I was in my young teens, it was the first time I realized that a woman could be a songwriter. Up till then, I thought this was just something that men do, that songs came from men. And as a child, you know, that made sense for me. But when I heard Blue, I realized that a woman could be a songwriter, she could mine her own inner life for material, Add, make it into something poetic, something legitimately art, and put it out in the public for public uh, consumption. That's a bad word, but you know, put it out in the public and have it be um, not only accepted and treated as something legitimate, but revered. Mm -hmm. So I, that's where the seed planted that I wanted to be a songwriter. And were you impacted at all by the politics of? The 1960s oh, and 70s? and I campaigned so. for McGovern when I was too young to vote. Uh -huh. You know, like door-to-door -door campaign canvassing. And my mother got really annoyed with me because I was too young to be doing this. But, um, yeah, I wrote a... This is unbelievable, but a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, um, my uncle's widow was going through his files, and for some reason he had a letter that I had written to Lyndon Johnson when I was, you know, what, eight years old or something, and I said, I would have voted for you if I would have been old enough to vote. <laughs> Did you go, you know, I, So yes, yeah. politics big from the beginning. Yeah. Were you at the Watergate? Uh, my dad, dad went, went. Yeah, my dad went to the hearings. Yeah. yeah, just just to be there, he was, um, deeply interested in politics his entire life. And so you were kind of a blend early of the country music you were hearing and the Southern rock scene and Joni Mitchell and the Beatles and the British invasion. And then tell us the list comes in 1973. Well, I was on the road with my dad straight out of high school and um, we're on the bus and rolling through the South, and um, he mentioned a song, and I said, I don't know that one. And he kind of raised his eyebrow, and then he mentioned another song. I said, oh, I don't know that one either, and then he got very alarmed. And he spent the next couple of hours with a yellow legal pad making this list of songs for me. And without benefit of Google, <laughs> or, you know, and he gave me the list, and he said, this is your education. And I took it very seriously. I learned those songs. And they were an education. The craft of songwriting, to write something so simple and so powerful, sometimes something with just three chords, but have it be something that lands on your heart, you know, that it was an education. And I learned those songs. And then I saved the list, um, thank God. And he died in 2003. I had the list, and my husband and collaborator, John, said to me, we should make a song. 
an album of songs from the list. And at first I really resisted that because my entire career I had um, not wanted to trade on my dad to do anything. In fact, I was almost overboard with that. I'm not going to, I don't want people to compare me or to use him in any way. But John was very persuasive, you know, like these are songs from the Great American Songbook and you could do them. We need to do this. So we did. We made an album based on the list. Was the list, I mean, I know the songs you recorded, was it random? Were it songs that he liked and you should listen to? Or was there a logic to the list? No, he wrote across the top 100 essential country songs, which should have been 100 essential American songs because they were really from everything from the blues, southern gospel, early folk songs, Appalachian ballads, all of those feeder streams that go into country music. And then in the uh, <clears throat> 80s, you really uh, start to make it, and uh, you're uh, making a name for yourself in country music um, as the label is used in Billboard magazine and whatever. What was it like... Uh, as a female performer, and thinking a little of what you said about Joni Mitchell uh, mm. being in that world in the 1980s? Well, I moved from Los Angeles to Nashville in um, 81, and I had purple hair. You know, I had lived in London. I was, you know, loved the punk scene there. And I... Um, had an attitude, you know, I thought, oh, well, they'll welcome me, you know, I've got something to say. And I was really persona non grata for quite a long time. Um, they didn't like the attitude, <laughs> the, the industry, you know, the, the powers that be. But you can't argue with success. And I started to get very successful. I was the, my first hit record, Seven Year Ache, was also a hit on the pop charts. And then when I made King's Record Shop, um, I was the first woman who had had four number one singles off one album. So I had leverage. To, you know, I kind of earned my respect with them. But I, I ended up leaving. <laughs> and how did you, I mean, and so you'll, we'll get to it, but you'll kind of evolve and change in terms of your style. But so you, you know, you were listening to rock and roll, you got the list, and you obviously have this family background in country music. How did you decide in the 80s that's where you wanted to situate yourself, the kind of music you played? Was it natural? Was it, I mean, how did you end up in that genre as opposed to straight rock and roll or something? You know? Well, I, I consider myself a hybrid artist. Mm -hmm. I mean, the records were going out through um, Nashville. And so they were marketed as country. It was, I mean, some of it was very new, you know, and I remember the, the synthesizers we used in the 80s, you know, how annoying they sound right now to me. When I listen to hear those records, I go, what were we thinking? But it was accurate for the, the time. Um, yeah, I consider myself a hybrid of everything I had grown up listening to, everything from Jethro Tull to Patsy Cline. Yeah, and the not so much Jethro Tull, maybe. You know, he's not listening. He's, John's not listening. I, that. <laughs> I know most of it. <laughs> and the and and kind of the process of writing and and being a songwriter. I think that's a mystery to most people. I think they can imagine what I do yeah. at some level. They can imagine even a novelist, but. Uh, how did you go about learning to write a song, and how do you write a song? Well, I won a poetry contest when I was nine years old, so I was already figuring out how rhyme schemes worked. Yeah. That, and that was very, um, I was kind of obsessed with that. It was so interesting to me. And then I read poetry all through um, high school and wrote very bad poetry myself and then learned to play guitar. I'd already played piano, learned to play guitar, and I started, you know, putting it together. But as you said, there is a mystery to it. There's a mystery to all creative work, you know, and when you kind of touch the center of that mystery, that's when the good stuff happens. You know that. And do you write kind of by inspiration or more structural oh. and methodically. I think it was E.L. Doctorow who said, you know, oh, I write only by inspiration. Fortunately, it strikes at 9 a.m. every day. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. 
But I am not that disciplined, no. I, I'm always writing, but I'm not always sitting putting pen to paper. Yeah. I'm sure you're the same way. Uh, yes. I, I guess, or computer key to uh, whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, although I'm a believer, I am a believer in structured kind of, I, I tell graduate students all the time that don't wait just for that inspirational oh, sure. moment. You have to do a little bit every day. Oh, sure. Kind of I, uh, the same, the yeah. same. And then so, so you, your, your career is taking off. Um, you think of yourself and conceive of yourself as working in many different kinds of music. And then you have a shift, at least people who write about you see it in the early 90s with interiors and see you as moving into a new kind of writing. Tell us about that and what was going on. Well, um, so after King's Record Shop and I had all this leverage with the label, I said, I want to produce an album myself um, and I want a lot of money. <laughs> so they gave me a lot of money and they said, okay, you can produce this album yourself. And I think they assumed that I was going to repeat the formula that had just been so successful. I actually went the opposite direction and I produced this very dark acoustic records, all of my songs. Um, you know, my marriage was falling apart at the beginning of recording it, I didn't realize that, but by the end, I did. I mean, I had to look at what I was writing, for one thing. Sometimes, I, I say that sometimes songs are like postcards from the future. You know, you go, oh, man, and then that. But I'm not the only writer who says that, that writing is out of time, you know, that's mm. out of linear time um, often. So I made this record, and I was really proud of it, and the head of A&R at the label came in to listen to it. And he didn't say a word through the whole album. And then he looked at me and he said, we can't do anything with this. Mm. And meaning they couldn't get it on radio. No, you know, it wasn't going to be commercially successful. <clears throat> and he left and I turned to the engineer and I said, I'm going to prove him wrong. And he was right. They couldn't do anything with it. They stopped trying and I was on a plane and I was so depressed just staring out the window going what am I going to do and um, I called my dad I very seldom asked my parents for advice which I really regret now but I did I called my dad then and I said I told him what was going on and he said screw him move to New York so I went into the label I told my manager I wanted to go in by myself. I didn't want him to come with me. And I went in and I said, look, this is just going to get worse. I'm going to do what I want to do. You're not going to be able to market it. You've got to let me go. And I thought I, they would argue. And he said, we'll miss you. <laughs> and that was it. 12 years on this label, it was done. I mean, I walked out. I had to lean against the wall for a minute, like, what have I done? Hmm. So... I moved to New York in 91. Um, I met John Leventhal, and I was obsessed with him. <laughs> and I had this idea that my destiny was bound with his. And he was clueless about that. And um, so I first asked him if he wanted to write a song with me. He did. Then I asked him if he wanted to make an album with me. We made this album, The Wheel, and my whole life changed. We, By the end of making The Wheel, we were a couple. That was 30 years ago. We've made seven albums together since then, and um, thousands of shows, and um, dozens of side projects. So I was right. <laughs> Remarkable. Can I, can I just back up? Why did... Why did your dad say to move to New York? Because I had been, because I had always wanted to. And he had an apartment, he had an apartment at 40 Central Park South for a long time. See, you, people don't realize that. He loved New York. Uh -huh. And um, he knew that I wanted to okay. be in New York. And my, you know, my marriage was over by then. He said, you know, just go. And how did that, so uh, we both live in New York, and I know New York is a big part of your life. 
how do you think being there in the 90s was already impacting what you wrote and how you thought of your own writing? Well, I, I wanted anonymity. Living in Nashville was like living in a fishbowl. You know, everything ended up in the art section. If you got in a fight with somebody in a restaurant and ended up in the art section, it was just, it was so oppressive. I couldn't stand it. And also, I, didn't, I never liked being famous. The whole idea of fame, I thought, was... Um, like, I saw it kill people, you know. I had no illusions about it being glamorous. So I loved the anonymity of New York. And then I got a circle of friends who <clears throat> were working at the top of their game as writers, as artists. It was so inspiring. Um, I found a community. And John, as a native New Yorker, you know, it just it was, it was just a perfect fit. I was one of those people who was a New Yorker long before they were a New Yorker. Do you think, I mean, so uh, I grew up, I'm a rabbi's son, so I understand the fishbowl, uh, but I was also a professor's son, my mother, and I felt when I entered this business, I kind of knew what it was. I had a feel for it, like a lot of people don't have a feel for it. Did you feel a little bit like that with music? You had seen kind of how it all worked, uh, or no, did it not? help you? Well, I think it helped me in that I was comfortable with the whole idea of what the life was like, you know. <clears throat> but like I said, I didn't have any glamour. I knew how grueling it was, how your private life suffered, you know. And my mother just hated it. She thought, well, if you're famous, if you're a musician, you get divorced, you get on drugs, you know, your family falls apart. This is a terrible life. Um, so she wasn't very encouraging. And, um, but also, like I said, I felt I had to push away too hard and for too long to, but it turns out I, I, it's what I needed to do, you know? I mean, I feel like a certain level of mastery of what I do now after 40 something years. And maybe I did have to push away that long. Did you feel, so you're shifting, like what were your country music in the eighties from my memory of it? It was kind of pretty conservative and mm. it was kind of white male culture still. Was, did that have anything to do with you kind of moving to New York, moving to a different... It's changed, obviously, a lot. We can get back to that. But was... Oh, my God. You're right. I mean, in the 80s, even the late 70s, because I had an album come out in Europe in 78 or 9, and then yeah. my first record in America in 1980. I mean, it still was very much a boys' club. I have a lot of obnoxious Me Too stories, you know, about how uh, record executives, promotion guys would treat women, you know, and even even the stuff like, oh, we can't play your record because we already have one woman that we're playing in the first, you know, hour of the show. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and we don't play women back to back. And there was all of that. I think some of that still exists from what I understand from young women that, yeah. you know, oh, we can't have too many women in the said and i remember i mean i remember just the perception from a northeastern jewish kid of country music in the 80s it was very it was like reagan's america it, willie nelson was an anomaly and it was all the rest my it's, dad was an anomaly and your dad, i mean he spoke right. out against the vietnam war for some reason he was able to sail above all of the um you know mm -hmm. the blowback from that but um mm -hmm. Yeah, a woman in my position with my, you know, who I was, my views, yeah. it wasn't easy. Back to the list. So then you recorded the list, or, or some songs from the list, and I was curious, how did it look? So that was in, what year did the list come out? Uh, 2011, oh. 10? Okay. It was a 10. Well, 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 that period, kind of, how did you look at it differently? When you revisit it, you decided I want to record from it. How did it look different from when you were 18 and first 
kind of went through that with your dad? Well, those songs were, by that time, were like old friends. I knew them very well. I, I had assimilated those songs. But so much so that some of them I said, I can't do that. You know, like um, She's Got You, which Patsy Cline had had an enormous hit on it what I thought had done the definitive version of that song. So John really pushed me to do it. I was scared to death to do that song. Hmm. And um, Take These Chains, you know, you'd had the Hank Williams version, the Ray Charles version, and John thought we should do Take These Chains. I was like, oh my God, I can't touch that. But I did it, and Elvis Costello, who's a a good friend of ours, he called me up afterwards and he said, there were only two versions of Take These Chains, now there are three. Wow. So that meant the world to me. Speaking of friendships, you have all these amazing friendships with musicians you often mention, Lucinda Williams, Elvis Costello. How have some of those relationships um, affected your art and music? Are there any in particular that you think? Um, well, I think it's good to have your competition aroused, you know, so I'm around, it really is. It's, it, it has pushed me to challenge myself. Um, Lucinda's a dear friend for a long 35 years and so is Elvis. And, you know, John and I were talking about Elvis yesterday, like there really is no one like him, no one with his sense of chord progressions, harmonics, you know, and his ability with language. He's, kind of, he's just insane, he's off the charts. And Lucinda being a very different writer, you know, more like a Hemingway writer, very spare, very, uh, and kind of aggressive in her approach. And Steve Earle, Great writer, obnoxious person, but great writer. No, I love him. I've known him a long time, too. But, man, it's like a brother that you get in fights with. So all of those people have aroused my competitive spirit. But a lot of times, I, I think it's very typical for all writers and artists to go through periods where you just go, I'm just shit. I can't write like them. I'll never be able to. I should just stop. You know, and then you pull yourself up and get back into it. What I didn't know early on, and I do know now, is that's part of it. That kind of feeling dismantled and then getting back to it. It's part of the process. Are you part of, is there a community in New York? I mean, Steve Earle lives in New York. Or is there like a community of musicians where... I know in Nashville, people literally will play together a lot. Is there anything like that in New York that you're playing? Um, John's last birthday party, we had one of the best like jam sessions I've ever been at in my life. It was great. This drummer friend of ours was actually wearing, you know, bells around his feet, and it was amazing. So, yeah, it so, does happen sometimes. And then, so the album um, Black Cadillac, I was yeah. hoping you could talk about it. It comes at this very difficult moment, lots of medical issues, your uh, parents passing away, all this stuff is happening and this beautiful album comes out of it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about putting that together and what I, it meant to I you? I love how you're doing this chronologically. It feels, it's great. It's like, I know. <laughs> I love this, Julian. I love this. Uh, so in a two-year period, I lost my dad, my mom, my stepmom, my stepsister, an aunt, there was just this um, avalanche of loss in my family. And I wrote the first song before anybody died, Postcard from the Future. I wrote Black Cadillac and I went, oh no. And then people started dying. Um, so I wrote all these songs. It was like a map of mourning. Um, and I didn't tip over into too much self-reference or sentimentality. I was really ruthless about my lyrics in that way. Uh, John wrote the music for four or five of the songs. Um, five, yeah, at least. And, uh, and yeah, it was, I was scared to put it out. It was, I, I hadn't done anything that quite that vulnerable. And 
there was this song that John and I wrote together called House on the Lake, and it was very specific about my dad and my stepmom's house on the lake in Tennessee. You know, the blue bedroom, um, wooden nails, rose garden, all of these really specific images. And I was, um, I thought, I can't perform it. It's just too revealing. And the first time I performed it live, this guy came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, everybody's got their house on the lake. Mm. And it just reaffirmed that it's not a trope that the more personal, the more universal, you know. So I put out that album. Um, some people, some nurses told me who work in hospice that they were giving it out to families, which was a great honor. And it was it was a moment, you know, and it was a good record, I thought. So that came out in 2005. 2007, I had brain surgery. So it was like these a few years that were really, really hard. And um, it took me a couple years to recover. So there was kind of a long period of um, darkness. And once you said, I, I can't remember, you told me or I read you or heard you saying it, you don't believe in closure. No, I what don't do believe in closure. What do you mean by that? Unless you're getting stitches. <laughs> um, this idea of closure to loss, you know, it's like, I don't see how that happens. Maybe the feelings about the loss change or, you know, I still have relationships with my parents. They're gone for a long, long time. I still have relationships with them. It's not closed. And even the pain is not closed. It's just different. And it's not, it's not debilitating. And by this point in your career and life, are you writing music? When you write music, are you thinking of it as music about yourself? Or kind of a la Bruce Springsteen, thinking of characters and stories you want to tell? Because you kind of, you also write uh, non-music. So how do you think of that by this period? Um, I write about myself. I'm afraid to say that after listening to Margaret Atwood and Vivian Gornick last night when they said a feeling is not a situation. I was going, wait. <laughs> it actually is sometimes for me. Um, but I, um, yeah, I write about myself, but I don't do fact checks on myself at the end of it, you know? It's like you can take poetic license mm -hmm. and put characters in it and make myself a character. And I really love geography in songs, you know? So place has weight like characters do. I mean, I, I guess teach songwriting classes often, and I always tell students, put furniture in your songs. People don't re -songed, uh, respond to songs about themes, you know? They respond to songs about the coffee cup you threw across the room and the door you slammed and the rain on the window, you know, that those visceral things evoke a lot more than just talking about love. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel the pull to get in more political in your music or... Is that something you wanted to basically? Well, I, I did in the last election, um, the, the 2016 election. Yeah. Um, and actually, after the, uh, the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, I wrote a song called The Killing Fields about lynchings in Arkansas. Um, I'll tell you the backstory just briefly. So. I've been involved in the restoration and maintenance of my dad's boyhood home. It was in a New Deal era colony in Arkansas. In 1935, it was built, FDR gave land um, to 500 really poor farmers and the Cash family was one of the families who received the land. Hmm. So my dad grew up in this New Deal era colony and in 2011, Arkansas State University was able to purchase it. And there were only a few of the cottages left out of the original 500. So I get asked all the time to participate in these projects about my dad. I generally 90% of the time say no, but this really captured my heart. So I was, um, I've been involved ever since in raising money for the maintenance and restoration and everything. 
So there's a woman who's the head of the restoration team who's a, this really sweet old Southern woman at Arkansas State University. And we started talking one day and she said with, about the history of Arkansas and racial, um, the racial history. And she said, I keep a list on my computer desktop of every lynching in Arkansas that was ever documented. I said, why do you do that? She said, just to remind myself every day. So it was so inspiring. And I, I just kept thinking about that. And John and I, on my birthday in 2019, went down to the, um, the lynching memorial, Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And it was profound, you know, it's like, and then in 2020 when the protests happened, it was like the veil of white privilege started to lift. And I wrote this song called The Killing Fields about the lynchings in Arkansas. Now that never got played on the radio and we made a little single and I sent the money to this uh, Peace and Justice Memorial Movement in Arkansas. But um, to go back and answer your question, Julian, I think it's really hard to write a protest song that doesn't proselytize. And once you start proselytizing, it's not art anymore, right? Um, so I'm, I'm careful. I have written a few. I think people like Steve Earle are very good at it. Yeah. Um, and I could learn from that. But I've been involved in the anti-gun violence movement for 20-something years. I spoke at the Million Mom March in 2000. You know, I've done everything from do a lion in Times Square, ooh, um, to write, um, you know, dozens of op-eds about it, and it's just gotten worse, but I'm not going to shut up, you know. Must be difficult in, t in terms, I mean, I think writers face this, whatever you say now will be seen through the prism of red, blue division. And as a musician, you're trying to reach as many people possible. So there's a, not a self-interest in avoiding it, but you want your music to be out there. It must be difficult to balance your kind of political positions and um, thinking about that audience reach. Yeah, but, I mean, what are they going to do? Not buy my record? I no. mean, you know, at this point in your life, you want to look yourself in the mirror in the morning and say, I stood for something, right? Yeah. And, um, I mean, to me, <laughs> gun violence is not a political issue. It's a parenting issue, and mm -hmm. that's the way I've always approached it. Yeah. Um, all right, I wanted to get... Well, before I get, I want to get to your collaboration, but what was it like um, recording with your dad? I mean, you did that, and uh, how, how did that go? Well, the one song um, that was important was a song called September When It Comes, and I had written these lyrics, and I sometimes I'm not careful about my writing, and I had left it lying around, and John found it, and he said, what's this? I said, at some lyrics I wrote. So he wrote this beautiful melody to it, the music to it. And um, he said, you know, if you were ever going to record a song with your dad, this would be the song. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, 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 I can't do it. And he goes, no, this, this is the song to do it. So it was a song called September When It Comes. And it was about um, dying, really, but couched in this elliptical, poetic way. And um, I went down to Nashville. We had the track, and I went down so my dad could put his voice on it. And he wasn't feeling well. He was pretty sick by then. And he said, um, OK, you take that back to New York, and if John says it's not good enough, I'll do it again. <laughs> I said, Dad, it's good enough. Um, so, And then he did die in September. And then, uh, so you have collaborated, the two of you, for a long time. 30 and, uh, years, yeah. And you'll hear from John in a little bit uh, as well. And uh, The River and Thread is a phenomenal album. And part of what's interesting is, I mean, a lot of it's focused on the South. So 
you're kind of going back to this region that looms large over what we've talked about. And at the same time, you're not displaced, but you've been elsewhere. Um, why did you two decide that kind of that's where the music would go? That's where the album would fall about that place? Well, it started with working with uh, in Arkansas with the restoration um, and seeing some of these people I had known from childhood, you know, and reconnecting with them. I mean, I had pushed the South away. I just I didn't want anything to do with it. Once I moved to New York, it just it was almost like I had to get the toxic parts of it out of my bloodstream in order to re-embrace what I really loved about it. And some of it was the people. The geography, the history, you know, I mean, the Delta, oh my God, it's like so much of who we are, it comes from the Delta, the the music, the literature, the violence, the redemption, all of those things. So that it started with going down there a lot for the restoration. And then uh, we went to Florence, Alabama. I have a friend who's... Um, she has this workshop where she hand sews these beautiful couture level clothes with beads and she has these women who do this for her and she's my friend and I you know wear jackets that she was made and we went down and she was going to give me a sewing lesson and John was taking a little iPhone movie of the sewing lesson and as she was taking the thread and the needle she said Honey, you have to love the thread. You have to learn to love the thread. Thank you. You have to learn to love the thread. And when she said that, I started to cry. And, you know, she wasn't speaking in metaphors, but I heard it that way. Yeah. And that started. And this was also John. He said, put a lot of characters in your song, you know, the geography of it, the richness of it. Where do you collab? Like when you guys are collaborating... Where are you sitting in your home? How does that work? Well, we have a recording studio in our home. We have a brownstone in Chelsea, and on the ground floor is a recording studio. So that, but I mean, it's also pillow talk. It just, it's like, we, it's part of a, a huge part of our relationship. And where do you like to write? Would you share? You told me the other day. I like to write in my kitchen because uh -huh. he's down in the studio. I, li I just like the light in the kitchen, the table getting up and leaving and coming back. You write, do you write it out or do you type? Or? Both. I have uh, both. Paper, phone, computer. No typewriter like Bob Caro. You don't no. Do no. Uh -huh. I have the most adorable picture of my dad teaching my then two-year-old son how to type uh -huh. on a typewriter. Um, I want to ask a couple more and then we're going to do some Q&A and then as a preview, John's going to come up and they're going to play a few songs together. So there was this incredible moment at Willie Nelson's 90th um, birthday, whatever you call it, concert, gala, where you and Chris Christofferson, this was what, a month ago, uh, played on stage. It made its way on social media. Can you tell us about that moment? It was very moving um, and um, what it meant to you and how it happened. Um, so there were a lot of artists on this show, um, and it was at the Hollywood Bowl for Willie's 90th birthday, if you can imagine, Willie Nelson's 90. So Chris Christofferson um, and my dad and Willie and Waylon Jennings were all dear friends, like brothers their whole life. Chris and Willie are the only two still alive, and Chris has severe dementia, he doesn't remember who I am anymore. Sometimes he doesn't remember his wife's name. He knows her, but he doesn't remember her name. And he doesn't retain anything from moment to moment, but he knows all his songs, all of them. He can go out and sing without prompt or anything. He knows it all. So I um, was going to perform one of his songs on the show, and he was standing in the wings, and after the first verse or so, he came out. And the audience went crazy when they saw him, and he just stepped in and started singing with me the song. Mm -hmm. I gotta cry talking about it. And um, I mean, everybody was crying. And we walked off, 
In 30 seconds, he didn't remember we had done it. It was gone. But that moment, he looked out at the audience and he lifted his face like, you know, there was some kind of light coming into him. It was so pure. It was just like his essence was still there. Um, yeah, I really missed my dad at that moment, too. It was, it was very moving. So anyway, as you said, it went viral on, on social media yeah. and saw me doing this as we yeah. walked off stage. <laughs> yeah. It's very, if you haven't seen it, you should Google, not right now, but you should, uh, it's very moving and, and it's, it's, but there is for just someone watching it and I knew he had uh, dementia, but in that moment, it's like he knows exactly who he's singing with and it's very powerful. Just the communication through the song. Yeah. And he knew exactly who he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question for me. Um, and we talked about this a little, there's a lot of exciting music from this world of singer songwriters, yeah. alt country, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and it's a very vibrant area now. It's kind of, I, I told someone the other day, it's kind of the new rock and roll. Yeah, That's where the I best agree. music is. What do you, what are some of your thoughts on kind of where music is and what you're excited by listening uh, from younger people? I just feel so heartened that there are all these young people who like play instruments, not just their computer. Yeah. that they write songs, that they're prodigies at their instruments, a lot of them, you know, like like Billy Strings, like we were talking about, Chris Thiele, Molly Tuttle, um, Sarah Watkins and uh, Aoife Donovan. All of those people are so inspiring. And it feels like... Um, like back a couple decades ago, I was worried about it. It's like, oh, you know, writing songs like this and playing, it's going to be like divining water with a stick, you know. It's going to be this old folk thing that, and now I feel so heartened, like, okay, I can die. It's, you know, <laughs> well, no, I can't right. die. But... <laughs> There's a lot of music to go. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to do a little a short uh, Q&A, some questions, and then uh, John, who is... I assume all of you know exactly who he is. He's an amazing producer, songwriter. He's just a phenomenal talent, and the two of them are epitome of a kind of collaborative energy. We'll play a few songs, but we have time for some questions and answers. So raise your hand and uh, use the moment to ask. This happened last night with Margaret happens. Atwood. It always happens, yeah. <laughs> In high school, I'm in my mind. I'm seeing the records next to my record player. There was um, Elton, Joni Mitchell, Tom Rush, um, early Fleetwood Mac, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, um, and then the first Neil Young records. I mean, I was just eating it all up, you know, just taking it all in just ravenous for all of it. So I played all of those people a lot. I'm sure there's more. Oh, Spencer Davis group. Do you remember that group? No. Steve Winwood? Steve Winwood. Very good. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> wow. Did you ever play with, get to play with Joni Mitchell anywhere? Not play with her, but I sat... Um, Elton, I have to hate to say this because it's like, oh, Elton. But Elton asked me to sing at his 70th birthday party, and Joni was there, and I got to sit next to her for dinner. And it was not long after she had had a brain aneurysm, so she was still in a wheelchair and not talking a lot, but she was so sweet. It was such a moment for me to get to be with her. Um, yeah, Josh. Well, we're not talking about the early years where I did do drugs and get divorced. <laughs> 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 I, 
I just figured out how to stop all of that, right? Um, well, again, I pushed away from her. I'm going to prove her wrong. I was very determined young person, rebellious. And you're right, it all came full circle. She was wrong, you know. But she was loving. She just wanted to protect me. You can take one more question. Were you raising your hand in the back? Before? Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Well, when I talk to um, students, I mean, I'm kind of a uh, stickler about rhyme schemes. So just the mechanics, the pure mechanics, you know, it's like learn, do your line drawing first. Know your line drawing before you move on to abstract art. Um, so that's one thing. And then about specific things. Also moving from um, specifics to something bigger, you know, not spelling things out too much, respecting your listener enough to let them bring their own life to it. At the same time, not being so vague that it just disappears. Also, no navel gazing. <laughs> you know, I used to be very bad at that, you know, like sophomore English student. Oh, and thank God I've grown out of that. So those are some things we talk about. Well, before I uh, ask John to come up, um, let me say two things. One is get, uh, to get, so when I write, I listen to music all, constantly with my little earbuds. So I've been listening to all your music in the last few weeks, uh, all the albums, and it's really a remarkable collection that you have made, uh, and it's wonderful to hear. Um, and so everyone should revisit her uh, albums. Uh, it's a real treat to Thank hear you. songwriting of that nature. And I'll say one other thing. One of the things I've learned in life is friendships made later in life are often kind of pretty incredible. Uh, we think of ones from your childhood or when you're younger, and that's how I met Josh here, and it, I kind of uh, hold that dearly, and becoming friends with you has been very special um, oh, Julie. and meaningful. So it's nice to share time d talking in public, too. I feel the same way. Just It's such a thrill and pleasure to know you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, come on up. We thought we would just do two or three songs for you um, from what we talked about. This is John Leventhal, by the way. <laughs> my 
best friend's wife She walks these hills in a long black veil She visits my grave when the night winds wave sees nobody knows but me the scaffold is high and eternity near she stood in the crowd and shed not a tear but sometimes at night when the cold wind moans in a long black veil, she cries o'er my bones. She walks these hills in a long black veil. She visits my grave when the night winds wail. sees nobody knows but me nobody knows nobody sees nobody knows but me Thank you. They don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> you never hear the word scaffold on Top 40 Radio. <laughs> um, is there something you want to hear, Julian? I was going to, anything? Okay. All right, this is a song I wrote. Uh, the lyrics and T-Bone Burnett and Lyra Lynn wrote the music. Um, this was written for True Detective. He was music supervisor for that television show, True Detective, and the second season was going to start. And He called me up and said, will you write some lyrics that are about destruction? You know, maybe a bomb could go off and something could fall off a shelf. I said, yeah, it's my wheelhouse. So it opened the second season of True Detective with Lyra Lynn singing it, but I recorded it for uh, my last album, She Remembers Everything. Oh. 
holy war Your love and my due diligence The only thing worth fighting for more thank you very much um i actually accompany him on that song oh not the was, other way around i was trying my best this is a song i wrote when i was 23 and it was my first number one record and i've been playing it now for 45 years this gentleman and i are the same age he tells me and um you develop a relationship with a song after 45 years, you know, in the early years, you're just like, you're just ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. no, you're just <laughs> besotted with the song. Love and money. Love what, what and money. Just want? love the song. It's the best song ever written. And then in the middle years, it's like, I can't believe I have to sing this song again. I can't believe I wrote this song. And then I you, hate you. And, and then, there's no money anymore. Yeah. And then you get to true love of the song. This is Seven Year Ache. And also, give more money to 20 Summers, right? <laughs> Josh and Aziz, thank you so much for inviting me here. I had no idea how much I would love it and how honored I am to be here. And Julian, thank you so much. This is such an honor and a pleasure. All right, this is Seven Year Ache. Two, three, four. You act like you were just born tonight Face down and a memory but feeling all right So who does your past belong to today? Baby, you don't say nothing when you're feeling this way The girls in the bar singing, who is this guy? They don't think nothing 
when they're telling you lies And you look so careless when they're shooting that ball Do you know heartaches are heroes when their pockets are full? You tell me you're trying to kill the seven-year ache And see what else your old heart can take The boys say, what is he going to give us a room? The girls say, God, I hope he comes back soon Everybody's talking, but you don't hear a thing. You're still uptown on your downhill swing. The boulevard's empty, why don't you come around? Baby, what is so great about sleeping downtown? There's plenty of times to be someone you're not. Just say you're looking for something you might have forgot. Don't bother calling to see you leaving alone There's a fool on every corner when you're trying to get home Just tell them you're trying to kill the seven-year ache See what else your old heart can take The boys say, what is he gonna give us a room? The girls say, God, I hope he comes back soon Tell me you're trying to kill the seven-year 